pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath and your message. Let all that I do, let all that I say bring honor and glory to you and to you alone, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Amen. Are you ready? We hear that question a lot, especially this time of year. Are you ready for Thanksgiving and all the work and shopping and cooking that it entails? I think I've been to every grocery store in the area at least twice, and no matter what, I come home and I can make the next list. I just can't seem to get all my stuff at the same time this year. So <clears throat> as I was thinking about that, of course, I have two of my grandchildren coming for dinner. So of course, you know, I always say, what do you want? Anything special? What are the things that kids want? My one granddaughter said, will you please make mashed potatoes? Have I ever served a turkey without mashed potatoes? I, I don't know where that came from. But then she also wanted chips and onion dip. Oh, yeah. Okay, so then her sister wanted sweet potato casserole. And I looked at her and I said, I didn't even know you like sweet potatoes. I said, and I've never made a sweet potato casserole. We will figure this out and I will do that. And then, of course, she wants homemade bread. And then they want homemade ice cream. What? So yeah, so it's uh, we we got it just about done. Except the other two grandchildren, okay, I had them for this weekend. They ate the homemade ice cream. So now we got to make more so that the two coming from North Jersey have some homemade ice cream. Thanksgiving really is my absolute favorite holiday ever because we really do focus on being grateful. We focus on family and of course food, one of my favorite things. Our reading today from Thessalonians is written, of course, by Paul to the church of, in Thessalonica. The church was, was new, it was only a, a few years old, and they were still growing in their faith. And one of the things that Paul really wanted to set straight with them was concerning Christ's second coming. Some thought Christ would return immediately, and, they were getting a little confused and perhaps upset, like, okay, it's, it's been a couple years, where is he? Let, let's go. Well, in the beginning, if you go back to the beginning of Thessalonians, Paul affirms them, he lifts them up, he praises them, and he told them how much he's missed them. And then if you read on into chapter 3, he sent Timothy to encourage their faith. And then we get to chapter 4, and Paul then challenges them. And he challenges them to live their life pleasing God every day to avoid sexual immorality. And he reminds them how important it is to love, to love one another, and to live as good citizens. He reminds them of their hope in the resurrection. And then he warns them to be ready. Now we know that the efforts to determine the date of Christ's return are really foolish. But we also know that there are many fools around. And a lot of people have decided to try and predict Christ's return. So I was going to print out a list of the different um, prophecies that some people have come up with. When I pulled it up on my computer, it was 15 pages long. That's how many foolish people know the date of Christ's return. But I did keep some of them just to share with you because some of them are amusing. In the year 500, three Christian theologians predicted Jesus would return in the year 500. They based that prediction on the dimension of Noah's Ark. Don't know why, obviously they were wrong. <coughs> and then in 19 or in 1533, a mathematician calculated Judgment Day would begin exactly at 8 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> In the late 1700s, the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, also known as the Shakers, believed that the second coming of Christ would be through a woman. In 1770, Anne Lee became the leader of the Shakers, and they believed she was revealed in the manifestation of divine light to be the second coming of Christ. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is part of our history. Let's see, in 1844, the fact that this failed to happen the way people were expecting was later referred to as the Great Disappointment. Some Millerites continued to set dates. 
Others founded other churches, and they continued to set dates when one date passed. Oh, well, I didn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. In 1847, George Rapp, the founder of the Harmony Society, preached that Jesus would return in his lifetime, even as he laid there dying. In 1861, Joseph Morris told his followers, don't plant any crops this year because he believed Christ was coming tomorrow. In 1901, the Catholic Apostolic Church founded, uh, was founded in 1831, claimed that Jesus would return by the time the last of its 12 founding members died. The last member died in 1901. Still, they're all wrong. Hal Lindsey, 1988, published a book, The Late Great Planet Earth, suggesting that Christ would return no later than 1988. Again, another foolish prediction. And the list goes on. Jerry Falwell, I'm sure we've all heard of him, um, predicted in 1999 that the second coming would happen within 10 years. And then the last one was Ronald Wineland predicted Jesus re would return on September 29, 2011. When his prediction failed to come true, he moved to date. And then he predicted 2012. And when that didn't happen, guess what? He moved the date, and he predicted 2013. He was finally convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. I am sure there are many who even today predict that they know when Christ will return. But the truth is, we don't know. The return date was talked about even in the book of Isaiah. And back in the book of Joel and Zephaniah. So then I got thinking about this. I thought, would you want to know the date? Would anybody want to know the date that Jesus Christ is coming back? It was interesting. I was telling Pastor Nicole, I had my two of my grandchildren for the weekend. And my grandson this morning asked me, so what do you, what's your message about today? So I told him. So I asked him, would you want to know when Jesus is coming back? Thankfully, he gave me a very good answer. <laughs> Or I wouldn't be sharing the story. <laughs> but he said, no, why would I do that? Because then I know I could be bad all these days and I only have to be good the day before. Which is very true. We wouldn't work. And then he and I got to this long discussion this morning about good works, good deeds. Do you know what you need to work? Uh, do good deeds. And I said, but if you have faith, you can't help but do good deeds. Because the more I love God, the more his love shows through me to help other people. We have work to do here. As Christians, we need to keep doing God's work until, until we die. There is no time that we get to retire, and I've said this before, there is no time that we get to retire from doing God's work. Who remembers the game Hide and Seek? Oh. Right? Played it as a kid. It was you know, back when kids played outside and played games and sit on their phones. And somebody would be it, right? Somebody was always it. They had to count with their eyes closed. And I don't know about you, but for us, it was always, you know, some people would try and watch it for us, right? Because then you had no time to hide. Then they decided we had to say one Mississippi, two Mississippi, to give you time to go find a place to hide. So you only had a few seconds. And when you hear the words, ready or not, here I come, they know that the person who was it was going to start looking for them. Now, childhood games are mostly fun, but they often contain just nuggets of real life. For example, the game of hide and seek can teach us an important truth about the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, Christ will come when he is ready. Ready or not, he will come. In his waning days of his last week on earth, one of the things that Jesus taught his disciples was to always be ready for his return. He had come in the flesh to die on that cross as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He would be buried, and yet we know in three days he would rise from the dead and ascend to God's heavenly throne to rule and to serve as the believer's great high priest. Then one day he would return as a victorious king to judge all of 
Earth's inhabitants. In Matthew 24, verses 36 to 51, Jesus laid out three crucial pieces of information about that day, the day of his return. First, that no one on earth will know when that's going to happen. In Matthew 24, 36, it says, Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son. Only the Father knows. And then he tells us everyone on earth needs to be ready for Jesus' return at all times. Jesus is not in heaven counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and waiting for us to be ready for him. While we may not know the date or the time of his return, we know, we are assured that he will return. That is a divine promise. And for this reason, Jesus declared, this is why you must be ready. Because the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. In effect, even before he uh, departed, Jesus said to the world, ready or not, here I come. So what does it mean to be ready? How do you get ready for Christ's return? Well, above all, it means to come to faith in him, to believe in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, to receive his forgiveness and gift of eternal life. No one is ready for Jesus. No one is ready for Jesus' return who has not received Christ as their Savior. Believers, you and I, are to be faithfully serving their master, carrying on his gospel mission into the world until the day he returns. Jesus promised that the believer who is found working when he comes will be rewarded. So what's taking Jesus so long to come back? We all want good things to happen in our lives, and too often we want it right now. We don't want to wait. But when it doesn't happen that way, we're tempted to ask, when? When, God? When are you coming back? But you see, most of us need to grow in the area of trusting God instead of focusing on the when question. If you're missing joy and peace, you're not trusting in God. If your mind feels worn out, you're not trusting God. The tendency to want to know about everything that's going on can be detrimental to your Christian walk. Sometimes knowing everything can be uncomfortable and could hurt you. So are you spending your life being impatient, frustrated, and disappointed because you don't have the answers? We must learn to trust the one who knows all things and accept that some questions aren't going to be answered. We prove that we trust God when we refuse to worry. You see, God wants us to live life by discernment, revelation discernment, not head knowledge. It's difficult to exercise discernment if you're always trying to figure out the answers to things. But when you're willing to say, God, I can't figure this out, so I'm going to trust you. You <clears throat> give me the revelation that will set me free. Then we can become comfortable in spite of not having answers, in spite of not knowing things. Trusting God requires not knowing how God is going to accomplish what needs to be done and not knowing when things will be done. We often say God is never late, but generally, he isn't early either, because his time is the perfect time. We spend a lot of time in our, or a lot of time in our lives waiting, because change takes time. Many people want this change, but they don't want to go through the waiting process. But the truth is, waiting is a given. We're going to be waiting. The question is, are we going to wait the right way or the wrong way? If we wait the wrong way, we'll be miserable. But if we decide to wait in God's way, 
We can become patient and enjoy that time. It takes practice. But as, as we let God help us in every situation in our life, we develop patience, which is one of the most important Christian virtues. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's developed only under trial, so we must not run from difficult situations. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do thorough work so that you may be, may be perfectly and fully developed, lacking in nothing. That's from James 1, verse 4. And as we develop this patience, the, patience, the Bible says that we can feel completely satisfied, lacking nothing. Even our relationship with God involves progressive changes. I know my relationship with God is so much different now than it was in the early days of my Christian experience. We learn to trust God by going through the process and the experiences that life gives us. We let go of trusting ourselves and we gradually place our trust in Him. Now looking at it like this, it's easy to see how timing is an important part of learning to trust God. If he did everything we asked for immediately, we'd never grow. We would no, never develop. Timing and trust work side by side. God gives us hopes and dreams for certain things to happen in our lives. But he doesn't allow us to see the exact timing of his plan, does it? Although frustrating, I'm sure, for many of us, not knowing the exact timing is often what keeps us in the, in the program. There are times when we might want to give up if we knew how long it was going to take. But when we accept God's timing, we can learn to live in hope and enjoy our lives while God is working through our problems. You see, we know that God's plan for our lives is good. And we must entrust ourselves to him. Only then will we experience true peace and happiness. The book of Genesis tells the story of Joseph, who waited many years for the fulfillment of the dream God had given him. He was falsely accused and imprisoned before the, the time came for him to do what God had shown him. Exodus 13, 17, and 18 tells us that God led the Israelites the longer, harder way on their journey to the Promised Land because he knew they weren't ready yet. They had to be time for their training. And they had to go through some very trying situations. Now they wasted a whole lot of time wondering about God's timing. But God never, ever failed to take care of them and show them what he wanted them to do. But see, the same is true in our lives. Oh, I wish how I would have trusted God totally many, many years ago. Could have saved myself a lot of worry time, a lot of worry hours. Worries that I didn't understand something or, the, or that I thought I needed more stuff or, you know, this and that, I have to have it. And ten years later, you're putting it in a yard sale. Uh-huh, come on, you all done it. We all know it. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, A man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps and makes them sure. Proverbs 20, 24 says, Man's steps are ordered by the Lord. How then can a man understand his way? You see, when God directs our paths, he sometimes leads us in, in a way that makes no sense to us. No sense at all. Maybe you can't figure it out, you don't understand. And we try to reason it out, right? We try and reason it with our limited intelligence. And we struggle, and we get confused. But there's a better way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Lean on. Trust in. Be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. Do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, 
know, recognize, acknowledge, and he will direct and make straight the plans that he has for you. Think about farming. After a seed is planted, the heat, the moisture, the pressure of the ground finally causes that outer hull to crack open. Then the roots shoot down, digging their way through the ground. Now this all takes time to happen, and it's all happening under the ground. And above the ground, you can't tell a thing is going on. But see, that's the way our lives are. After we plant seeds of obedience, we feel like nothing is happening. But all kinds of things are happening. God is working on us inside. And like that seed, finally, burst through the ground with that beautiful green shoot, our seeds of obedience finally break forth <coughs> into beautiful manifestation of God in our lives. Prosperity, favor, promotion, honor, all kinds of good things come out in the open where they finally can be seen in harvest time more than ever before. You hear from God, you enjoy his presence, and you're led by the Holy Spirit. Blessings surround you, and joy and calm delight in your mood. The more you trust, the more you are obedient, the more joy you will feel as you wait for his return. If Jesus came through that door right now, would your life be aligned to what his plans are for you? Would you be ready to stand up and with great confidence know without a doubt that he would look at you and say, job well done, my good and faithful servant? If you're not able to do that, if you don't have that confidence, then please spend as much time preparing for his return as you will be spending preparing for your Thanksgiving dinner. Amen? Amen. Amen. Take a moment and let us pray together the prayer that the Lord taught, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing song today is Standing on the Promises, number 370.